Hi everyone. Hi everyone, it's one o'clock and we are uh, going to get started with our uh, webinar on material science. My name is Craig Gifford and I'm a communications manager here at Swagelock. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our material science overview webinar. For the next 60 minutes, Bob Bianco, who is a senior material science and technical lead for administrative manufacturing program, is going to guide us through how to choose the proper materials for your fluid systems uh, and keep them leak tight and operating efficiently. He'll walk us through specific alloys that resist corrosion, how different materials behave, and how industry standards impact your material options. Plus, he's going to take some of your questions. Speaking of questions, you can ask them at any time during this webinar via the Q&A function. Please look for the chat bubble with the question mark inside of it in the upper right hand corner of your screen and then type in your question. You can, again, you can do this at any point during the presentation. I'll be collecting those and Bob will go through them at the conclusion of this presentation. So without further delay, let me um, get everything ready and send it over to Bob and have him take over. So Bob, please go ahead. Thank you, Craig. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to, to everyone on, online and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, tech talk. Um, I'm just going to start my slide deck here. I think Craig went over my background. So let me just uh, get, get right to uh, the outline of today's TED Talk. So today I'm going to, in the brief, uh, you know, in the, in the next uh, 45, 50 minutes, <clears throat> try to be, make all of you to some level a material scientist so that uh, you can understand uh, what goes into material selection when it comes to swage lock products and their applications. And just like like Craig said, I'm going to kind of walk you through a little background and, and then and then kind of walk you through the uh, the material systems that uh, we um, utilize and specify for for the products that we make and the applications that that you use them for. So here's a brief outline and let me just uh, start right into it then. So I'd like to um, just uh, give you a little couple of term, a uh, uh, couple of slides to go through and, and get you some terminology so that we can work through the rest of the, the slide deck. Um, but uh, here's the the major groupings of materials that uh, we deal with and you all deal with on a day to day basis. And this can this this uh, has to do with just about anything that contacts you or you use on a daily basis, as I mentioned. And nevertheless, <clears throat> this is this is also a, a pretty a pretty extensive list of, of the materials used and that go into swage like products. However, in the bottom right, you know, the metals and alloy systems are the are the predominant uh, materials of choice because of a, a number of of the of the very um, a critical and demanding uh, requirements for your applications. So let me give you a little couple of uh, uh, terms related to materials so we can start here. Uh, the first one being uh, that of of the definition of an alloy, and 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 in the, and we're going to talk a lot about materials and alloys and and, and alloys that are selected for the applications, uh, your applications and our components. So just to kind of uh, give you some 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 uh, baseline information, you know, an alloy is a mixture of, of one or more uh, metals or elements which are selected based on, on their overall interaction with the host material uh, to make them stronger or more corrosion resistant or or a combination of all of that, you know, other physical and other types of physical and mechanical um, uh, properties for the material. Here's a couple of key elements and, and alloys that we deal with. Um, we have have two pretty significant ones in the iron based system, uh, those which have a small amount of carbon in it, which we refer to as carbon steels. And and you probably if you drove to into work or drove to the store or whatever, you're probably uh, interacting with materials like that in your vehicle all the time. Um, the next one is the evolution to make a more corrosion resistant iron based material, and that's the evolution of the stainless steel materials, 
which are iron uh, that's mixed with a combination of chromium and or nickel uh, to do that. And then some some unique or uh, we often refer to them as, as exotics because they have more of a niche application and and market uh, are the are some uh, unique nickel alloys, specifically ones where nickel is mixed with copper. That's the Manel family. And then also in the copper based systems, there's a mixture of, of copper and zinc, which makes brass, which are good for low temperature, low strength applications in, in our products. Another term, uh, since we're kind of speaking of the elements, is at an atomic level, is the, how these uh, atoms in these mixtures are arranged, and then therefore, as a result of that, the types of properties that they, uh, they exhibit as, as a result of that. So with, with crystalline materials like metals and alloys, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, those are made up of atoms that are arranged in a three-dimensional pattern that repeats itself over and over and over. And then therefore, you know, if that, if that arrangement and that pattern is unbroken, you have a perfect crystal, so to speak. And there's two uh, main ones associated with the, the key engineering materials that we utilize, uh, that being a face center cubic structure and a body center cubic structure. And if you look at the right-hand side of this uh, slide, you can see how they're further defined. Uh, a body center cubic material uh, has is a pattern of atoms which are arranged um, as are arranged in the corners of a cube in the center of the cube, making what we refer to as a little more of an open uh, lattice, which allows for other uh, impurities and alloying elements to easily move through that particular lattice. Uh, the other one, which is probably the most common uh, crystal structure for engineering materials, is the face center cubic one. And these are, this is pretty uh, in critical of the austenitic stainless steels, nickel base alloys, aluminum alloys, copper alloys, all of which have this particular crystal structure. Again, uh, the pattern here is uh, atoms on a corner of a cube followed by atoms on the face of a cube. And if you look at the little um, uh, sphere model in the middle in the blue, you can see that that, that structure is a, is a little bit more what we call closed packed and a little closed off. So it's a little more difficult for things to move around in there. And this is very important when it comes to um, things like hydrogen embrittlement and, and other types of um, uh, other, in, in, uh, other types of um, corrosion mechanisms. Uh, that you could, you know, would select materials with such a crystal structure uh, because of that uh, type of resistance. Two other terms that I want to mention and kind of go through is before we go through the different alloy systems and the corrosion mechanisms is the microstructure. So we started at an atom, atomistic level. Now we're moving to a microscopic level. Um, and, and, and this is the term uh, as we refer to as grains and grain boundaries. So as I mentioned, that three-dimensional pattern repeats itself in all directions. And unfortunately, um, there is no such thing as a perfect crystal. And it's filled with a lot of uh, imperfect types of defects, one of which is a grain boundary. And all a grain boundary is, is an area where there's a misorientation between two adjacent perfect perfect areas of the crystal. Uh, so you can kind of see that at an atomistic level in the center of this slide. What it looks like in reality is what you see in the left-hand side, which is a polished cross-section of a material that has been chemically treated uh, to attack the grain boundaries and therefore reflects light differently. And those grain boundaries show up as black lines on that on, in that face. Or in the case of, um, macroscopic uh, features and in, in, in grains that you can see on the right hand side from that cast aluminum ingot. So you can you can understand uh, as we work our way up in scales that these microscopic um, imperfections in a crystal can also be a source or a site for corrosion attack as, as exemplified in this slide. Uh, the last uh, uh, term I want to kind of go through with you is the term, look at that one, sorry about that, I didn't know I was going to do that, 
is the term of phases in a metal. So we've talked about some imperfect uh, defects in, at the atomistic level and microscopic level. Another, not necessarily imperfection, but another um, uh, microstructural feature you need to, need to understand is the term phases in a metal or alloy. And so uh, each phase is a unique um, constituent of the material based on composition and physical and, and physical uh, properties or physical structure. And so when you um, exceed, when you have more than one phase, you can see on the right hand side of this slide a, uh, a mixture of two phases in the material at a microscopic level as shown here in the two different colored regions. So you have a little tan and, and a tan um, a feature or phase that's mixed into a darker brown uh, grayish um, um, phase in this material. And what you see there is an actual two phase stainless steel called a duplex stainless steel, which is a mixture of two different phases in the iron system. On the left hand side is again a, a representation of a material with a single phase. And what you see see there are at a, at a, at a higher or lower magnification, the grains which I just went through and, and showed you in the previous page. So these phases, uh, these constituents and, and multiple phases also introduces interfaces like grain boundaries, which could be sites for chemical attack. And so in many cases, chemical resistance or corrosion resistance uh, can be linked back to whether the material is single phase or, or multiple phase. And so these can be sources of preferential attack and, and poor corrosion resistance. So all of this is, is considered when selecting the proper materials. So with that in mind, or, or in that, you know, after that introduction, I would like to now start to introduce the different uh, forms of corrosion that, um, uh, that our products seem to uh, face on a, on a daily basis in their applications. So uh, here are some examples of, of one type of form of corrosion, this being what we call uniform corrosion. And you've probably seen this type of corrosion in, in, with iron base um, alloys and materials uh, all over your, your environment. And you know, here's some examples here are, are this little post at, at a pier uh, down by, by, the, by the ocean. On the right-hand side, you can see that uh, dark uh, reddish brown um, coloring and coating on the outside of that steel component there. And then in the middle of the page, you can see a, a probably several centuries old uh, cannon ca from cast iron steel or from a cast iron that is just weathered and corroded from the environment over the, that period of time. And it's really important to note at this point that um, we as material scientists and we Swagelock as as um, manufacturers of pressure containing components um, obtain materials from suppliers and machine these into parts and you and you and you get a nice shiny component a nice uh, silvery grayish uh, nice and and well and with a with a with a very very smooth surface finish component that uh, you use in your applications. Uh, but what you really have to understand is that you know Mother Nature and the and the and the um, the thermodynamics of the situ of those materials um, dictate that it's it's always going to try to revert back to it, its form that it started in, and in most cases when you when you mine and ref and and ref mine and, and retain or, or claim the, the ores of these materials, and then you do all you can uh, with a lot of different energetic processes to separate uh, sulfur and oxygen from it and, and take the, the elemental component of the raw ore and convert that into some type of engineering material that goes into your product. But over time, it's gonna revert back to, to what you see here on this, on this page. And so we do everything we can to slow that down and prevent it. We can't stop it, but we can do our best through, through um, material selection and material development to create um, offerings and material so, uh, options to uh, minimize what we know is gonna happen overall. 
So on this slide, you can see uh, this is just a summary of the different forms of corrosion that occur in nature with, with a variety of different materials. Uh, right there at the top, you can see uh, the second from the left is the uniform corrosion, which occurs over a wide uh, area or a large surface area of the component. Uh, very similar to rusting uh, of, of your steel fenders and car bodies and anything uh, uh, iron carbon materials out there. Um, and then there's other examples on this page which may or may not really impact or or be uh, very prevalent when it comes to the applications of our components, but many of them are, and I'll walk you through them here in the next few slides. But to so. As far as uniform corrosion goes, you know, it's always an issue that that uh, ugly rust, you know, rust colored uh, look on steel components. You know, steels were cheap; they were very, very durable. You can make them, you could, you could forge them, you can extrude them, you can weld them, you can cast them. Very, very, very uh, flexible and and widely used um, materials. However, you know, they were very prone to to rusting. And so, about a hundred years ago, uh, Philip Monarchs, who was who was a young was a young German at the time, um, started the the revolu the stainless steel revolution when he first uh, uh, introduced or discovered uh, the stainlessness of adding enough chromium to iron to uh, prevent the uniform corrosion that we saw before. And here's a picture of a stainless steel automobile that's uh, at the uh, Crawford Auto Museum here in Northeast Ohio. And, uh, you know, that's nice and, and shiny, shiny silver grayish uh, looking and, and will certainly uh, last for a long, long time as long as you keep it out of uh, key elements that could lead to its degradation. So this has certainly solved the problem of uniform corrosion, but in, in many cases, uh, situations has led to some other um, localized forms of corrosion as a result of the mechanisms in which this particular material uh, lends the corrosion resistance from. And so that's uh, what I'm going to cover here on this slide. So how does a, how does a adding enough chromium to an iron-based material render it stainless? Well, here's a little mech here's a little mechanistic uh, um, description of what that process is. So what happens is because there's enough chromium in, in the base material, and if there's ample an, uh, or a source for oxygen in the in the environment, uh, it will form a chromium-rich oxide film on the surface of the stainless steel. So that previous picture, although looking um, silvery and metal metallic looking, there is actually a very thin but transparent. Um, passive film of, of chromium rich, rich oxide, which is providing the resistance to rusting from occurring. <clears throat> but as I mentioned, it's a blessing of it's a blessing to to uh, uniform corrosion that the stainless steel has the chromium content. But it can it also can be a curse because as you damage that film and try to replenish it it will reform as long as the substrate has enough chromium and the environment has a source of oxygen. Uh, however, in some applications, which I'll show you here in a, in a few minutes, you know, this can be difficult to maintain. And what you see there is in that scratched um, uh, um, little um, pit, so to speak, or a little well, uh, you will have a ch ever changing and more aggressive environment forming that will continue to oxidize or dissolve the underlying substrate material, even though it is a same as steel uh, because it lacks either oxygen or the ability to reform that film. So let's walk through a little of those forms of, of corrosion. As I mentioned, pitting, this is a localized form of, of corrosion which occurs because of the damage to the passive film and the environment in which uh, it, it uh, is depleted of oxygen so that you don't have an oxygen source to reform that film and the, 
And further, the chemistry within that pit can get even more aggressive, meaning uh, you can increase the amount of chlorine in it if you're in, a, in an environment with chlorine, like uh, the sea area or, or on the ocean or near the ocean, as well as because of the depletion within the pit, you can actually increase the pH considerably, changing the overall dynamics of reforming the passive film within that. So instead of it ref, uh, passivating, and the pit will continue to grow deeper and deeper until it could actually penetrate through a wall of a, of, a, of a tubing. The other type of localized corrosion is referred to as crevice corrosion. So everything uh, about this type of corrosion is the same as in pitting uh, corrosion, except that you don't need to damage the passive film to create that, that um, pit or that, that well for the change in the composition. Uh, of the environment. Uh, in this case, you have a geometric feature like a tube clamp or a cre or a um, or a flange fitting or any type of in, in some cases a weld, a poor weld that creates a little ledge or a little uh, crevice underneath. It can all build up and uh, degrade a material locally, like you can see here in this picture. Uh, what's important to note here is because the geometric feature creates the pit. In many cases, uh, the critical temperature for corrosion, a crevice corrosion to occur, can be significantly lower than pitting corrosion. And I'll show you that in the next slide here. Uh, this is a comparison, an alloy comparison uh, uh, from lab testing that measures the critical pitting and the critical crevice corrosion temperature of a variety of different engineering materials available. On the left hand slide of this plot are, are, are a series of Austin at stainless steels. Uh, so these are your 300 series stainless steels. On your right hand side of the of the of this chart here are your duplex stainless steels. So this is the two phase materials that that I showed you a little earlier in the introduction section. And so what you can see here is that the chemistry of the material, uh, specifically the the molybdenum content can drastically increase the resistance to both pitting and crevice corrosion as a result of the increases in the critical pitting temperature and the critical crevice corrosion temperature. Likewise, on the right-hand side, uh, increases in, in, in key elements such as molybdenum, nickel content, in the du and chromium content in the duplex stainless steel uh, exhibits a similar behavior of improving resistance to these localized forms of corrosion. So this is a great, summary chart that we go back to and reference uh, or frequently to uh, help customers uh, select better materials if they're having issues with crevice or pitting corrosion uh, in and around a chloride type of environment. Another type of corrosion that's, uh, that's very tip common is galvanic corrosion. This is where two very dis dis dissimilar mater materials from an electrochemical uh, potential uh, perspective are in contact with one another and also in contact with a what we call electrolyte, some type of uh, fluid that can help to complete the, the electrical circuit, which would drive this particular form of corrosion. And, and likewise, you know, I know when I when I have a face to face meeting, I usually ask the audience, you know, what is the most commonly used um, uh, common use practical practical product that you use on a day-to-day -day basis which galvanic corrosion is the basis for its for its mechanism and you know after pausing and getting some answers i would give the the the, the actual answer which is a a battery so this is an actual useful mechanism uh, as well as this is a useful approach to protect another material through a galvanic protection pr process. So this is the form of, of corrosion there. I'm gonna just skip that one there. Uh, another form of localized corrosion is intergranular attack. So we talked a little earlier in the intro about how you can actually uh, chemically attack preferentially grain boundaries and, and therefore expose them in a microstructure. Well, if you're not careful, depending on the environment, uh, the grain boundaries can be a source for very rapid attack uh, because in some way the chemistry adjacent to them 
has been changed and altered and is now a poor poor it can, is now poor poorly resistant to uh, that chemical. And one of the examples is with a number of the um, austenitic stainless steels. If you don't control the uh, cooling rates or the heat input from a welding process or a forging process when you're heating parts up or a, a annealing process, you can rob the you can rob the um, um, stainless behavior of the uh, the material adjacent to the grain boundary uh, as a result of forming um, chromium rich uh, carbides on the grain boundary, which is shown here in the schematic below. And here's an example of what an intergranular uh, attack would look like on a component. So you can see it, it unzips the material, uh, for lack of a better word, in this fracture along grain boundaries, and they don't have much resistance afterwards. Another type of corrosion that, that uh, a lot of our components uh, deal with is stress corrosion cracking. Um, and this requires a material that, that can be very susceptible to it, like, a, like your higher strength stainless steels or, that are used or, or, or materials that are some of the common, common, or common stainless steels that are used in their compression fittings, et cetera, as you can see here in the bottom left. And no, that is one of our competitors uh, uh, compression fittings, not ours, that you can see there in the bottom left. Uh, this also requires a, a fluid, so a, a fluid which is corrosive in nature, and it can still be a mildly corrosive material, but under the under the uh, material um, susceptibility as well as under some type of tensile load, like a compression load from a compression fitting or internal pressures, this can create an attack along grain boundaries or other materials and then propagate that crack uh, as a result of the applied loads. And so this could be under a static load or even a pulse load, which uh, is, is the corrosion fatigue mechanism. Um, another um, niche form of uh, stress cor corrosion cracking is sulfide stress cracking. And this is very common in upstream oil and gas applications. Uh, known as sourgrass cr cracking, so uh, hydrogen sulfide, which is becoming more prevalent in uh, oil wells, especially ones in which um, a variety of methods are used to try to recover as much of the oil as possible by interjecting uh, seawater and thereby creating uh, creating uh, chemical reactions which generate hydrogen sulfide, and then you have to deal with that in the upstream process. Uh, but H2S includes in itself is very hazardous and corrosive. Uh, so this would attack the metal, but it also um, would generate uh, atomic hydrogen, which could lead to special cases of hydrogen embrittlement. And so um, selecting materials for, for resistance to hydrogen embrittlement, in addition to resistance from um, hydrogen sulfide, is very critical for these particular applications. So that leads us to hydrogen embrittlement. I think this is one of the one of, um, another form of environmentally uh, induced types of uh, corrosion or cracking. Uh, so there's a lot of materials in which which hydrogen, being one of the smallest and most mo smallest molecules in atoms, as well as one of the most prevalent materials in the in the environment, uh, can readily get into materials and really impact the atomic. Uh, bond strengths and bonds between the at atoms in their periodic arrangement and can, as you can see in these pictures on this slide, you can see these failures are not, uh, there's not a lot of um, ob or noticeable observations of a lot of plastic deformation to the parts prior to failure. They usually occur along uh, at locations where there might be a stress concentration uh, thus in, indicating that it can be very uh, not sensitive when hydrogen gets diffused into materials. But this is certainly something that can be measured in materials uh, through mechanical, standard mechanical testing proceed processes where you can measure the overall ductility or the ability of material to plastically to form upon uh, lo being loaded. And so these are ways of, of categorizing and um, resistance to the hydrogen embrittlement, which is shown in the next couple of slides here. So here's 
Here's uh, five um, Austin Innix stainless steels. These are these are commercial engineered materials. You might uh, recognize some of them. You can actually through doing um, mechanical tensile tests of samples that have been exposed to or referred to as charged with hydrogen in a furnace uh, or samples that weren't charged with hydrogen and you can compare the overall uh, ductility levels. So in this case, on the left hand side, um, there's these you're seeing with these with these with these um, little plots here, uh, large amounts of reduction in area as a result of hydrogen uh, absorption, de decreasing the ductility of the material. Uh, however, on the right hand side with these other materials, you can see there's little to no impact of hydrogen on their ductility and therefore those materials would be considered uh, more resistant to hydrogen attack. And that's and so that summary of a, of, a, of a group of testing from a receipt from a researcher at one of the uh, DOE labs here in the in the United States um, almost 50 years ago is shown here on this slide. And so across the, the x-axis, you can see that's nickel content. Along the y-axis is uh, the retained ductility. So again, a large number here is considered uh, is having almost complete retention of its ductility after being exposed to hydrogen, a little opposite of the previous chart. But, but what I'm showing here on this curve are some examples of commercial materials that you that we actually use for a number of our components. And so you can see when it comes to a hydrogen service where we would re recommend uh, using our baseline 316 material uh, because of its uh, nice combination of iron and nickel contents within it and therefore minimizing um, the overall impact of hydrogen absorption and how that impacts the ductility of the material. Whereas on the right hand side, you can see the higher nickel containing materials, or if you can sit, go to the far right, those are actually considered nickel based materials, such as an in Inconel 625, which these materials are, are less likely and would not be recommended for a hydrogen application. And the last form of corrosion is, is a microorganism or mi microbiologically influenced corrosion or MIC. Uh, this is where microorganisms in, uh, in, in, in your fluids, so this could be uh, regular, this could be uh, lake water, pond water, any type of fresh water across the globe has different types and levels of microorganisms. Uh, this could also be seawater. We see it within seawater also that there's microorganisms with influence corrosion. And this occurs in either one or two ways. As you can see in the left side of this slide, you can get enough of the microorganisms to start to um, kind of deposit and grow on parts where they can actually make uh, geometric features or crevices that can get attacked or directly these microorganisms can uh, create situations either from their waste where they actually have a very low pH, acidic, aggressive type of waste, which could lead to large pits, which you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. Or in other cases, there are microorganisms which actually feed on things in the material like sulfur and phosphorus. Uh, and, and actually work them, themselves by that consumption of the material uh, through the wall of, of a material, almost like if you're ever uh, seen wormed wood. Uh, I have seen situations with thin sheets of stainless steel in which microorganisms from a potable water container tank had been attacked by microorganisms leading to a leak. So it's that's too surprising. Um, from you know, it might be surprising to note that you know little organisms can do such things to um, pretty, pretty uh, meaty and, and rugged material. Okay, so the last uh, for the last uh, 10, uh, 15 minutes, I just want to walk you through the different material options and and some of the um, material uh, selection recommendations for certain applications. And so I'll start that by giving, showing you this slide here. So this is a, a list of the various materials, metals and alloys that, that Swagelock uses to make their components 
uh, either the entire component or there might be some parts of a component such as uh, diaphragms in a valve or springs in a valve or, or, or stems of a valve, uh, which some of the materials towards the bottom of this particular slide would be used for. So they're listed from top to bottom in order of, 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 of use. So stainless steels are, are the big workhorse, specifically our premium grade of 316. And, and then the other materials, which you, which you can see there as we work down the page. So what I'm gonna do in the next couple slides is just give you a little bit of an overview of the different, of these different materials. Um, what's different about them? Where, what's comparable um, corrosion behavior in certain, in certain fluids, as well as, you know, specific applications or niche applications where certain ones are preferred and recommended over the other ones. So to start with, um, you pro probably saw a couple of different um, types of stainless steel listed on that previous slide. There are five forms of stainless steel uh, and they're listed here. Um, austenitic, which is the, probably the most common, probably one that you're most familiar with. Uh, this is uh, primarily the 300 series stainless steels, your 304s, your 316s, et cetera. These are very common and are probably the most uh, widely used of the stainless steels. And then as you work down, you can see uh, ones such as ferritic. And the difference between those two is the crystal structure that which predominates according to the chemistry. So your austenitics are, are iron, chrome, nickel alloys. Your ferritics are iron, chrome alloys. Uh, your duplex, which is a mixture of those, those top two, uh, and it's con that's controlled according to the chemistry. Those are also iron, chrome, nickel alloys, but not as much nickel to stabilize your austenite phase, enough nickel to have a mixture of those two phases. Uh, Martin Siddick, again, are also your basically iron uh, chrome alloys, in some cases a small amount of nickel and other components to help with the, with the hardening of the ferritic microstructure in the material. And then the last ones there on the bottom, your precipitation hardened materials. You've probably heard, uh, you may have may be familiar with the 17.4 pH or the 15.5 pH. You know, these are, can be um, heat treated and aged to higher strengths uh, in certain applications, which, uh, which we predominantly use uh, as, as for components to things like valves, et cetera. So here is a little bit more of a, a detailed breakdown uh, within this, within some of these stainless steel families, specifically here, the austenitic stainless steel. So at the top of this tree, uh, what I'm showing you is the is the type three, 304 material, the 18-8 composition. This was the, the first stainless steel alloy that was invented over a hundred years ago. And you could see uh, off derivatives or off these branches, are derivatives of that composition with specific um, applications or solutions to certain problems with the original material. So uh, for example, uh, across the horizontal to the left, adding sulfur to 304 makes the material more uh, machinable. Um, adding things like titanium, niobium, and tantalum to the 304 makes the material more weldable and less less uh, sensitive or and less, and less um, likely to be sensitized from a welding or heat treatment process. And then as a result of the localized, the, the pitting and crevice corrosion problems that 304 has, uh, increasing nickel and molybdenum le contents led to the 316 composition, which as I mentioned is the baseline uh, in, the, in the lower carbon form, the 316L, for, for swage lots uh, premium grade of stainless. And then some derivatives off of that uh, in the, in, uh, as you continue down the page for this, the super austenitic materials, which were further alloyed uh, with increasing amounts of chromium, nickel, molybdenum, nitrogen for improving resistance to localized co corrosion as was, was shown in that, um, some of the lab tests in the previous couple slides ago. So to kind of uh, continue down that tree vertically, the um, 
standard Austinites, as I mentioned, have branched off into uh, versions that have been had been or the chemistries have been changed to specifically attack things like localized uh, corrosion of pitting crevice off to the left with the super austenitics and to the right um, you know the compositions kind of changed uh, specifically to attack other particular applications such as sulfuric acid and very very uh, concentrated um, oxidizing acids uh, that that alloys like inkaloy um, A25 have certainly been good good materials to um, to resist that. So super austenitic six mollies that higher levels of of chrome, nickel, molybdenum, nitrogen, in some cases copper, uh, leads to um, a material with slightly higher mechanicals, but more importantly, um, significantly improved resistance to to crevice and, and, and pitting corrosion in chloride environments. Um, and so there is a new, a new version, a newer version of the six moly alloys uh, developed by Allegheny Ledlam, the AL6XN alloy, uh, which has replaced the 254 SMO. Uh, this is referred to as a 6HN. And so when we have customers that are having issues with pitting and crevice corrosion, on their 316 materials that they've ordered from us uh, or have that in, in their particular um, applications, we go to this particular material first and foremost. And this usually in most 80, 90% of cases solves those particular issues right away. So there's a little more detail behind the evolution of these new alloys, as you can see across the, the, the middle row of this table that these newer super austenitic or six moly alloys have higher levels of your nickel, chrome, and molybdenum, which contributes to these um, improved uh, resistance to pitting and crevice. And so within these six moly, these different six moly alloys, uh, you can see uh, in this particular plot, even with the subtle uh, small changes in composition can contribute to uh, further improvements and in, in, in measurable significant statistically significant improvements in resistance to pitting and crevice and that's why you know we are recommending the newer versions for our for our customers applications there uh, so as i mentioned in colloids 825 and how it evolved uh, it's shown great resistance as you can see here on the right hand slide side of this slide with its resistance to um, high concentrations of sulfuric acid uh, it also has uh, has really good performance in sour gas applications and is recommended for them uh, because of that. In the uh, nickel alloy or, um, community, um, there's, here is a little summary of, of the evolution of those materials. So again, if you start with your relatively, your commercially pure nickel, um, there are some niche applications we're adding copper to them to develop to form the monel materials or higher strength monel materials and in, in, by adding a little aluminum and titanium these have some really good niche applications in reducing acid applicate at our environments uh, such as uh, hf um, hydrogen fluoride etc uh, especially in things like alkylation uh, processes uh, but further further developments down the left or right hand side of this slide by adding things like chromium and and other elements to make nickel more corrosion resistant. Again, uh, the addition of chromium even a nickel forms of, helps to form a passive layer, improving uh, resistance to corrosion, especially localized forms of corrosion. But a further increases in certain elements at in, or produces a higher strength and higher temperature material in the nickel alloys. And then if you go all the way down to the bottom of the slide, um, there are some even further more expensive and niche and alloys that can address almost most of all your corrosion problems if you have the budget for that. And those are the Hastelloy materials. So nickel base alloys, you know, more expensive, uh, relatively immune to to stress corrosion cracking, have much improved resistance to pitting and crevice than the iron-based stainless steels, and in many cases can handle or alloy to uh, have higher strength and temperature resistance. So, you know, they're big workhorses for certain applications 
uh, in and around um, chemical and refineries, as well as in, in, in the hot sections or the hotter sections of gas turbine engines too. So as I mentioned, Monel, which is a nickel copper alloy, excellent resistance to reducing environments for hydrochloric acids and hydrofluoric acids. Uh, so this is certainly a, a lower cost um, option for these particular environments. The next material that you would recommend or go to if this couldn't cut, cut it in these environments would be to your Hastaloys, and there you would be spending probably an order of 10 to 25 times more uh, for those materials. Uh, 625, as I mentioned, this is a pretty complex uh, evolved alloy, as you can see there uh, in the in the key elements that are that it make it up. Uh, this again is one that, that has a wide range of improved properties from strength, uh, high temperature uh, res um, resistance, uh, resistance to localized cre uh, crevice encrosion, as well as good performance in sour gas applications. So, you know, if you're having issues with um, the 316 and a lot of applications, uh, there's, you know, this would be another another option to try to go to if some other uh, intermediate ones uh, have not have not uh, panned out for you. And then all the way down, as I mentioned, the Hastaloys, once some of the most expensive materials, but some of the best. Uh, corrosion resistant materials out there. And then lastly, the group of materials I wanted to kind of wrap up um, the presentation with is our duplex stainless steels. So these, as I mentioned, are, are a mixture of the different properties from your ferritic and your austenitic grades of stainless steel that's done, it's, it's pr produced that way by controlling chemistry. Uh, the grades that you will come across are usually the four digit um, numerical codes here, where the first two numbers refer to the chromium content and the uh, second two refer to the nickel based content. So you can see on the right hand side of the slide is the table, the composition of those. So you can see 20. So if you look at the duplex here in the middle of this fan, this tree at, at 2205, you can see that the chromium levels uh, are right around the 22. And, and the 05 is, is the nickel content is right around 5%. And then if you go to 2507, you can see again, you know, higher amounts of chromium and higher amounts of uh, nickel in those materials. So that comes at a little bit of increase in cost. But the other benefit of duplex stainless steel is, as you remember from the lab testing, excellent resistance to pitting and crevice corrosion. But the other benefit is, is a higher strength material. So you may have situations where you want a higher um, um, working pressure in in your particular application, and this you know you want and you can't cut it with with your with your regular sta austenitic stainless or your super austenitic. This would be the material that you would go to next. And I was you know mentioned here as as far as um, you know there's a little summary of, of the duplex stainless steels, the different. Uh, uh, types of of, of um, trademark names for those by their suppliers. Um, we utilize the 2507 of alloy uh, uh, pretty routinely in fittings as well as tubing. It solves a lot of issues that our customers have because of a great mixture of properties, both mechanical and resistance to the localized corrosion. There are some limitations you got to you have to be concerned about when when dealing with duplex, although it has stronger uh, properties, as you can see in the plot on the bottom right. Uh, there are some limitations on temperature um, because it has a ferrite constituent. It can't be used at temperatures below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, also, because of the alloying composition, you can't. Uh, use this material above uh, 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it starts to promote a lower, a, it starts to produce a microstructure which can embrittle the material. Probably the safest way to say it. So just to kind of summarize everything here, here's a little overview of, of the use of, of duplex stainless steel, especially in the oil and gas um, uh, industry and environment. Um, there. There are preferences for 
the preferred materials in and around oil platforms. In the Gulf, because they don't have uh, temperature or low temperature concerns to deal with, uh, they would they prefer the duplex stainless steel because of its higher strength and its um, its higher working pressures that are tolerable. Whereas in in low in applica or areas of the globe where lower temperature is a little bit more significant, uh, they ref they prefer the six moly the super austenitic materials because they won't have an issue with lower temperatures. So to summarize, when it comes to material selection, you know there's a lot of um, there's a lot of pretty demanding applications and a lot of different mechanisms of corrosion that your applications and our products see. And so material selection, you know, can can uh, really, really kind of cover a gamut of of those different opportunities and challenges. But in in selecting material, uh, you have to keep in mind both of these particular criteria of you know their overall performance or corrosion resistance and the price of the material. You can certainly you can easily reference materials that perform much better, but they'll come in most cases are going to come at a significant increase in cost of the material. And so that's what I want to kind of leave you with here with this particular particular um, this last slide here that summarizes that behavior. So a 316 is our workhorse material. It handles probably 60, 70 percent of the applications our customers have. And there's a lot of instances where there's uh, more demanding environments or you know the 316 is is, is starting to uh, meet its lifetime and so in many cases uh, customers are are looking to upgrade or looking to better better attack or resist and uh, and look for better solutions to their problems so with that i'll open the floor to questions Craig, I think we have about 10 minutes we can yep. or roughly that we can walk through these. Yeah, uh, great stuff, Bob. Thank you very much for that. We're going to leave Bob up on camera here because we do have a few questions that have come in. And again, if you have a question, uh, please uh, send it in through the, uh, uh, the little chat bubble icon in the upper right with the, the question mark in it. Our first question, Bob, actually goes back to something more in the beginning of the presentation. Um, <laughs> is the CR rich uh, oxide electronically conducive? Uh, not really. No, I mean the the film itself is going to be more of an insulator, but um, it is pretty thin. You know, it's probably angstroms in thickness, so um, it doesn't change the overall um, electrical conductivity, electrical properties of the stainless steel. But the film itself would be more of a more of an insulator than a conductor for sure. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, another question comes in. Um, Oil and gas customers, especially uh, the ones that are offshore, mm -hmm. are starting to require uh, exotic materials more frequently. Things like super duplex and titanium, for right. example. Right. You know, how do you know what fittings or tubing materials are compatible, uh, and are these materials harder to work with? Again, I think you covered a, a piece of this a little bit, but you know, the the. Uh, the listener just really wants to know is how do you know what kind of fittings and tubings uh, or materials are compatible with each other? Right. Well, we actually have a series of what we call engineered combinations that we have evaluated and tested that allow for some mixing of fittings and tubing. So there's a we we've done this because of of a lot of what that cut that particular um, person has mentioned in their question is that there's customers are upgrading now as there as a lot of these materials are seeing the end of their lifetime because they're having corrosion problems but in many cases our our, our fittings aren't necessarily um, uh, failing or showing signs of corrosion at the same rate as, as tubing so in many cases we we have recommended and we have tested and are allowing for mixtures or com, con, or mixing or combining our standard 316L uh, fixtures or fittings 
with upgrades and tubing such as your six Molly or your eight uh, eight twenty five or a nine oh seven or nine oh got a nine oh four um, tubing that is still very similar chemically, so you don't have galvanic corrosion issues. Um, and you also don't have an issue with the um, mechanical properties or the hardness of the tubing. So there are fittings and the mechanism of how our fittings uh, seal the tube in still works very well with the original uh, uh, stainless steel fittings. So we have done testing, uh, both, both uh, physical mechanical testing as well as corrosion testing on those combinations. And so there is a series of uh, mixes and engineer combinations that we we recommend or allow and and there's others that we're look further looking into so it's very difficult to mix a duplex with our 316 fittings because the 316 fitting and and more more specifically the ferrules in the fitting which create the seal don't have the necessary hardness and mechanical properties to dig into to a duplex tube and so that's a combination for a different reason, not because of the chemical interaction between the two, but more we don't create the seal in that compression fitting as necessary. So there are some limitations to what you can combine, but we do have a, a list of ones you can. Oh, great. I'm going to stay in a, in a similar vein here. Are there any disadvantages of super duplex or titanium tubing when compared to 316L other than the cost? Well, I mean, some of the things I pointed out when it comes to duplex associated with temperature and the application temperature where it's used uh, may limit it over 316 and the, and the other stainlesses. Um, and then the other thing with the duplex is because of its higher strength, it can be more difficult to bend when you're assembling it. So sometimes you might want to bend it a little bit more or need to bend it a little bit more for wherever you're installing it. And that can be a limitation or a problem uh, where the austenitic and the, the, the super austenitic and the austenitic would be a little easier. So those are some trade-offs or some limitations in the duplex. When it comes to titanium, um, certainly cost is going to be a big thing there. Uh, and certainly you have to understand your environment really well because titanium, um, for lack of a better word, is a sponge for certain environmental elements. So it will absorb oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen. Um, so if if it's containing some of those particular materials, it's not a good it's not a good material for that application. If it's containing seawater, it might it might work very well. But uh, there are a little there are some breakdowns uh, to where and when titanium can and can't be used. There's some there's some additional information in the North Sox standards for where and when it can be used. Um, and that's that's a uh, tech talk for another day. I can probably give you 30 minutes on the North Sox standards. I can give you another tech talk on, on hydrogen embrittlement. So there's there's I gave you a pretty high level uh, introduction to a lot of things here, but there's a lot of uh, more detail that we can dive into if, if those particular uh, applications and those and that information is something valuable to you. No, that that's great and. Um... I know uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. I know we have a bunch of other questions that have come in, uh, but we are uh, running out of time on on our webinar today. We will work, Bob and I will work with um, mm -hmm. your local SSC to uh, to get those questions answered and back out to you through them. Um, but we thank you for your time today and for joining um, a Swage Life webinar on material science. We really appreciate your time today. If you have any questions, please follow up with your SSC. And thank you and have a great day. Bye.